Good evening, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, pardon the noise. Uh, my name is Ken Herndon. I'm the university archivist, and I'm an associate university librarian here at Queen's University. And it's my great honor to welcome everyone to our 40th annual archives lecture. Uh, Dr. Karen Dubinsky will be uh, delivering a lecture uh, this afternoon, and this will be our first in-person lecture since 2019. So in 2020, I emceed it from my dining room table virtually, uh, and the, the whole thing was virtual. Last year, we made it to our offices, but we still did it virtually, so at long last, we're here, and we're very glad to be here with you. Um, getting to this 40th anniversary uh, lecture is a milestone. It's a real testament to the generations of staff who are worked on this event, as well as, as the distinguished speakers who have generously shared their work and their time based on our archives and archival research generally. So next, I'd like to invite Dr. Mark Asperg, our Vice Provost and University Librarian, to give a few remarks in the land acknowledgement. We're pleased to have Mark join us for the first time for an in-person uh, lecture since he came to Queen's in 2021. Cool. Thank you, Ken. Um, many thanks, everyone, for coming today. And welcome to the 2022 University Annual Archives Lecture. Um, this is an important event in the calendar of the university, and um, we are delighted, as Ken said, to be able to invite everyone here in person today. Being in person just provides us with, I would say, renewed and invigorating opportunities to engage with each other in conversation and reflection in response to what I know is going to be uh, a very um, uh, exciting and interesting presentation today. Um, being in person today in this beautiful space is also an opportunity for us to begin in the best possible way, especially as I stand beside a wampum bead inspired wall, to begin today with grateful acknowledgement and respectful acknowledgement that Queen's University is situated on the territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. Land acknowledgements like this remind us of the history that precedes us, of the shared responsibility that we have together today, and of the opportunities before us to advance on a journey of truth and reconciliation. The annual archive lecture is meant to highlight the extraordinary collections that are held here at Queen's University in the University Archives. But not only that, the university, um, uh, the annual archive lecture is an opportunity to highlight how those collections are used to the benefit of researchers and to create extraordinary research outputs like you're going to hear today. So today, I would really just like to thank Dr. Dominski for joining us today and sharing her scholarship with us. I would like to thank all of you for coming today, and it's delightful to see so many of you here for the first in-person event in several years. And I would like to thank the team at the University Archives for pulling this together in such a wonderful way. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the podium back to Ken so that he can uh, advance us in this program, and I hope that you enjoy the event very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So just a little, a little bit of a plug. For those who don't know, the Queen's University Archives has a special two-fold mission here at the university. It undertakes its activities in order to manage, preserve, conserve, and make accessible the information assets of the university itself, which is kind of unique in the university archives, and to maintain an, so to maintain an authentic record of the programs, the people, and operations of the university. And it provides archival management and conservation for culturally significant records of external organizations and individuals in support of teaching, research, and service at Queen's University. So we received here at Queen's the first archival document in 1869, and today we have grown to over 10 linear kilometers of textual records. We have over 2 million photographs. We have tens of thousands of architectural plans and drawings, and thousands of sound recordings and moving images. So for undergraduates, graduates, faculty, community, there's tons of stuff here for you to use in your activities or uh, either for professional scholarship or creativity. The archives is privileged to hold the records of regionally, nationally, and internationally significant individuals and organizations from a wide range of scholarly disciplines and occupations. 
including the historical records of the city of Kingston, the county of Frontenac, and the Kingston General Hospital, which speaks to the enduring town and gown relationship between the university and the communities it serves. And of course now, we are priv privileged to hold and make accessible Harry Tanner's archives. So before we go further, if I could ask you all to put your cell phones on uh, silent mode or turn them off, I've just remembered to do that myself. I'd also like to acknowledge the, uh, the work and support of Heather Holm, Lisa Gervais, Nancy Petrie, Sean Badley, Jack Seymour, Kim Dixon, Judy Young, Emily Zhu, Natasha Watt, and Kaylee Gregory, uh, who all contributed to pull this event together and to provide all the necessary digital, financial, or physical supports. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome all of our special guests, the friends and family of Harry Tanner. Welcome, we're delighted to be able to share with you today. Uh, the lecture itself will actually, as you can tell, be recorded. We will make a recording available on the Queen's University Library's uh, YouTube channel. We have had the last several of these recorded. And uh, we can, uh, uh, if you look at the archives.queensu.ca website, we can point you in the right direction. There will be a question and answer session uh, following the lecture. It will be facilitated gratefully by Dr. Susan Lord. Uh, I and Heather Holm uh, will be floating around with uh, microphones. Uh, because of the sound uh, and because of the setup, it's important that if uh, Susan can acknowledge you, we'll bring a mic to you. If you can speak into that, that'll ensure that the, um, the questions and answers will be uh, recorded with the rest of the recording. So I'd like to introduce our honored speaker, Dr. Karen Dubinsky. Karen teaches in the departments of Global Development Studies and History. She has published and edited books on a variety of topics, including the history of gender and sexuality in Canada, the global 1960s, adoption and child migration in the Americas, Canadian Global South relations, and the politics of music in Cuba. Her most recent book is Cuba Beyond the Beach, Stories of Life in Havana. She is currently working on the history of Canadian-Cuban cultural and social relations. With Dr. Freddie Monasterio, she is the producer of Cuban Serenade, a podcast series on the history of Cuban musicians in Canada. Today, Karen's lecture topic will be an artistic chronicle of Havana in the 1960s, Cuban-Canadian Harry Tanner. Karen, welcome again, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, thanks to the archives for this invitation. Heather, I'm looking at you, but I know it was a, uh, I know you're not a, the, the only person at the archives, but I've had most of my, my dealings with you. Thank you so much for this, for this invitation. Um, and thank you to my sister Kelly, who's here from Ottawa. Um, thank you especially, and I'm thrilled to have special guests at this event. Um, Harry's partner, Becky Taylor, who's here from Toronto. Harry's daughter, Harso Gutierrez, who's here all the way from Havana. Harry's friends, Gary and Anne-Marie Greenwood, all the way from Oshawa. Um, and all kinds of other related, Harry-related people. Harry was a magnet, and there's some Harry-related people um, that I'll actually introduce when I, because I'm going to talk about some of them. There's just been a reunion between Harsel and her former babysitter who lives here in Kingston, <laughs> which is just beyond awesome. I started my career as a 19th century historian. I've never actually had the family members of my research subjects sitting in the audience when I talk about them. This is incredibly stressful and wonderful in equal measure, both at the same time. I'm also gonna be sticking pretty close to my notes because I'm timed and I don't, uh, I'm gonna try very hard not to, not to go over time. So my entry in this story starts in Havana in February of 2017. I was there to present um, a book that I had written about everyday life in Havana to the annual Cuban uh, book fair, which that year had made Canada the country of honor. I joined a delegation of 70, more or less, um, Canadian writers. After my session, a woman came up to me and she said, I'm Canadian. I came here in 1971. I'm still here. You might want to interview me. In fact, I did. 
Um, in the 1970s, Adrian Hunter had been an uh, English as a Second Language instructor for a Canadian development project in Havana that had helped build um, an engineering school by bringing Canadian engineering professors, including one from Queens, uh, for short courses to train Cuban students. This was undertaken by an NGO called CUSO, Canadian University Services Overseas, the first international NGO that was invited to work in Cuba after the 1959 revolution. This conversation with Adrian blossomed into a full-scale research project on Canadian-Cuban ties. My work emerges from the conviction that people-to-people -people relationships, friendships, and joint projects have created multiple mechanisms for policy, social, cultural, and social, cultural, and economic development. These ties take us far beyond the world of governments or state-to-state -state relationships, and they often don't conform to official or expected political scripts, which is why they're so fun. I expect to work on this project forever. As I was leaving, back to Adrian's house, as I was leaving her house in Havana, the first conversation we had, I saw these two paintings in her hallway. I literally stopped in my tracks. Adrian told me that her Canadian friend, Harry Tanner, who had been a filmmaker and an artist in Havana, painted them. You should look him up, she said. He's back in Toronto now. A few months later, I met Harry at the home he shared with Becky, Tan uh, Becky Taylor in Toronto, and he let me record many hours, many hours of conversations. I was joined occasionally by two other colleagues who researched Cuba um, in the 1960s, Professor Cynthia Wright, a historian at York University, and Professor Susan, Lo Susan Lord, here, a film scholar. Harry's health was already in decline. A while into our interviews, he had to move into a hospital, and then, finally, a long-term care facility, where he passed away in November of 2019 at the age of 85. That he wanted to continue to talk to me in hospital and then in the, in the care home was clearly an indication that he knew he had a story to tell. I've also been through every scrap of paper in his uh, personal archives. This is in his home in Toronto. Um, this includes two decades of letters home from Harry in Havana to his parents here in Canada in the 60s and 70s, wherein he described his life in revolutionary Cuba. The reason we're all here today is because these incredible documents are now here at Queen's. So here's the story. Oh, here's my version of a small bit of the story. <laughs> Harry Tanner was born in Manzanillo in eastern Cuba. His Canadian father, Charles, worked for the Bank of Nova Scotia. His mother, Dorothy Todd, was originally from Indiana but grew up near Piña del Rio in Cuba. Harry, or sorry, Charles and Dorothy met each other at a tea party organized by the Royal Bank of Canada in Havana. Charles was then transferred from Havana to Manzanillo, and he, that's where he and Dorothy began, began their family. First Charles, and then Harry. Manzanillo was, as Harry described it, totally a company town, a place of misery and riches. He spent his first 10 years there. The Tanner boys attended Colegio Jose, Marte, uh, Jose Maria Heredia, ironically for this Canadian family, named after a revered Cuban, Cuban poet whose work, Ode to Niagara, is known, I believe, by every single Cuban I've ever met and probably many, many generations back. And in fact, it now adorns a plaque beside uh, Niagara Falls, where I personally have helped to escort um, many, many uh, Cuban visitors who were interested in seeing it. The family moved to Havana in 1944, where they enjoyed the life of the Anglo middle and upper classes of pre-revolutionary Cuba. There were fewer than 300 Canadians in Cuba in that era, while the U.S. population was around 12,000. The Tanner boys attended, uh, enrolled in Boy Scouts and attended a bilingual private school. Their parents immersed themselves in the social world of their class, joining all the right service, art, and athletic clubs. 
it was a very comfortable life. Quote, you could live here and not even know Cuba existed, Harry later recalled to a Globe and Mail reporter. But even a prote protected adolescent foreigner realized that the 40s and 50s were dangerous times in Havana with frequent political assassinations and kidnappings. In 1951, Harry's parents sent him to Atlanta to attend Emory University, but he didn't last long. I hated academics, I hated the US South, I hated the racism. He returned to Cuba and started taking art classes with a Hungarian painter in Havana who told Harry's father that his son had talent and he should go to Europe and study. Charles saw this as a great way to get his son out of the country during a dangerous period, but Harry had already become politically at least aware, if not involved. Not as much, he said, because I was Canadian and not Cuban, and nobody took me seriously because I was Canadian. But I felt the same things that the Cubans were feeling. I saw the misery, the corruption, the oppression, the bodies in the street. In a short memoir he published in Canada's Saturday Night Magazine in 1984, when he was back in Canada, Harry uh, asked himself why he stayed in Cuba after the revolution. Why was I more sympathetic to the revolution when others weren't? He evoked these memories of what he saw in pre-revolutionary Havana. Perhaps I stayed because I knew things my father never wanted to know. However, when his father um, offered him a trip to Paris, Harry jumped at it. He spent 18 months studying, and yet as soon as he refer, uh, returned to Havana, he got very politically involved. His one what he calls overtly revolutionary act still caused him emotion as he recalled it decades later. He was sent to Miami to pick up what he believed was a piece for a machine gun. He dressed up in touristy clothes and spent most of the day in a Miami hotel room waiting for a call. Finally, he received the package which came in the form of a large pink stuffed dog. I'm so sorry there's no photo of that. <laughs> So here I was on the plane with this dog. I was scared shitless, he told me. At the Havana airport, on his return, he recognized his contact um, who helped him push through the crowd and dash off. A few days later, it was New Year's Day, 1959, and he watched President Batista's plane, literally watched it depart. A week later, he leaned over the balcony of his girlfriend's apartment in Havana and photographed the revolutionaries rolling into town. Everything changed in Cuba as in Harry's life. The speed and the breadth of the change of change immediately after the revolution was staggering. In agriculture, housing, education, health, Reforms were extensive and, in state building terms, almost immediate. So too were cultural reforms. Harry gravitated towards the many openings in the film world. When he was in Paris, he had encountered new wave cinema. He spelt some, spent some time on film shoots, and he learned how to use a friend's camera. Back in Havana, through a writer friend, Gabriel Cabrera Infante, who himself became a huge name in uh, Cuban literature, uh, Harry met another big name in the cultural world, filmmaker Tomas Gutierrez Alea. He made the film uh, Fresa y Chocolate, a Strawberry and Chocolate, still probably the most internationally famous uh, Cuban film, among many, many, many other works. He took me in, this is Harry, he took me in, uh, intellectually speaking, and as an artist. I loved him. As revolutionary Cuba occupied itself creating art schools, literacy campaigns, and film institutes, Harry started frequently, or sorry, started frequently frequenting the newly opened offices of ICAIC, the Film Institute, which goes by that acronym. They, uh, they latched on to me, says Harry, because I knew something about technology and cameras. Though in truth, he'd done very little film work in Paris, but given that there were only two professionally trained filmmakers in Cuba at the time, Harry's little bit of experience went a long way. Initially, he was offered the position of director of the newsreel se section of ICAIC, but this didn't materialize. Now, legendary documentary 
um, filmmaker Santiago Alvarez was chosen instead. Harry attributes this decision to his being Canadian. They weren't going to give me a position like that, he said. He had no revolution, he had no history with the 26th of July movement, the revolutionary movement. In his estimation, quote, I never did any real work for the revolution. So he didn't get the big job at Ikeik, but he did become working full time, uh, he, he did began, begin working full time shooting newsreels. Amid heightened tensions between Cuba, uh, the Cuban and uh, US governments, but before the US blockade, filmmakers were scrambling to procure equipment. One of Harry's jobs was to source cameras, dollies, and lights, uh, and anima animation tables as well, basically helping to physically set up the first Ikeik film studios. His film output was prodigious. From 1959 to 1970, when he left Ikeik to pursue another career as a painter, which I'll get to, Harry worked in various capacities on, by my count, 17 documentaries and six feature films. He worked with many of the most important filmmakers from the creative cauldron that was Ikayik in the 1960s. The first film he made, uh, the, excuse me, the first film he worked on was um, This Land of Ours in 1959, the first film that was made after the revolution. He's credited as second assistant director, but he also played an unusually significant role securing the location. This 20-minute film is about the hard life of peasant farmers before the revolution and uh, the better future, of course, promised by Castro's government's reforms. It was filmed in Harry's hometown of Manzanillo because Harry arranged with the American mill manager, still known, of course, to him and his family, that they could shoot in the mill. Months after the revolution, revolutionary filmmakers are permitted to film a didactically anti-bourgeois, pro-peasant film in a United Fruit Company sugar mill still under US ownership because the company, according to Harry, didn't want any trouble with the Cuban government, with the new Cuban government. I think this is just one lovely example of how Harry's ambiguous national status carried often some advantages. In 1963, Harry got a chance to work with someone he described to his parents as one of the world's foremost directors. Soy Cuba, I Am Cuba, was Revolutionary Cuba's first foreign co-production made by famed Soviet filmmaker Mikhail Kala Kalatozov. I have practiced his last name constantly. Uh, and me, Eastern European, I should be able to do that. It was an amazing gig. To his parents, he wrote, Quote, Some, sometimes shivers run up my spine when I think of the responsibility of my position. In any part of the world, I would have had to wait many years to get a crack at a job like this. He was, I believe, the second assistant director credited. Soy Kuba told four interrelated stories of the miseries of life before the revolution. It is really an amazing film, but in terms of narrative, didactic is not a strong enough description. Nonetheless, he wrote to his parents, I think Kalatozov will knock off another Cannes Film Festival prize with this picture. The camera work is fabulous. The inventive and creative genius of the cameraman is, is fantastic. In fact, he has made moves which many cinematographers will envy and wonder how it was done. Harry was right on one score. Soy Cuba remains treasured for its innovative cinematography, but it did not thrive as a film. It was barely seen anywhere for decades until it was rediscovered at film festivals in the US in the early 1990s. A US film co uh, company got the rights from the USSR, uh, restored it, and none other than Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese re uh, relaunched it in 1995. In 2007, this beautiful cigar box package DVD set uh, was, uh, was released in, in the US. It remains, however, as a film, it remains virtually unknown in Cuba, treasured by film scholars, film buffs, but that's about it. Harry made his own mark on documentaries. 
He threw himself into all components of documentary filmmaking. He researched images of mosquitoes for a short film on viruses he did for the health ministry. He learned how to do time-lapse photography uh, to film Reynaldo Castillo, one of Cubans, Cuba's championed sugarcane cutters. La Tecnica de la Victoria, the technique of victory, featured Castillo, who Harry termed a windmill at work, to teach the thousands of Cuban volunteer cane cutters how to work more safely and efficiently. That, he said, was probably his most popular film. It was shown everywhere with a projector, he said, over and over again. And it actually helped people because, as he said, I don't know how many people chopped their hands off when they were um, working as volunteer cane cutters. He also branched out into animation and made a series of films about a, co a comic character, Pepe Trinchera, Pepe Trench. Um, I'm gonna show you this film after the talk, but I will, I will introduce it here. He worked on this with another foreigner, Ari Kaik, the Australian Harry Reid, as well as Juan Padron, who, was, uh, who became Cuba's premier animator. Pepe was a humorous character who illustrated a serious issue the Cuban government's call for trench building as a form of civil defense. So basically what this is, is a Cuban version of the duck and cover civil defense films that we had here in North America, but of course the enemies are reversed. Um, instead of the Russians, the Cubans were worried about the Americans. For all the ambiguities and conflicts um, and turmoil sometimes, I think, that Harry experienced as a first world foreigner working in a revolutionary state film institution in extremely nationalist times in Cuba, it really does bear noting that two foreigners were instrumental in teaching Cubans, sort of, how to do civil defense. And also, it's funny, not ironic, but funny, as, as I will show you. His career at Ikayak ended in 1970 out of frustrations, both professional and personal. In 69, he completed his last film, a short film about tractor maintenance. I was so fucking miserable, he said. <laughs> it wasn't only that making document documentaries about tractors bored him. His first wife, Yolanda Arenas, an actress, left Cuba in 1968. Her departure came as a shock, and they had bitter disputes about her decision. To his parents, he explained, she says I'm imprisoned here, that we're all a pack of sheep, that I live in slavery. None of these things are the least bit true. The two had spent the 60s living an active, artistic, revolutionary, revolutionary life in Havana in the film and uh, theater worlds. In his correspondence, Harry constantly explained himself, especially, I think, to his banker father, who, of course, left the country very shortly after the revolution and did not share his son's political views. Through his correspondence with his family in Canada, Harry narrated directly what living in a revolutionary society meant to him. In March 1962, for example, he explained, I suppose this letter is to you some sort of political propaganda. It may sound like it. I write to you of those things that are important in my life and in Yolanda's, the things that we live day to day, the things that make us tick and give us life. It's a new life. Maybe it's a little strange and incomprehensible to you. We have strong faith in what's going on in Cuba and in Fidel, and we're doing all we can to ease the road into the future. What changed for Yolanda, I don't know. But what changed for Harry, at least I think in artistic terms, seems to have been his mounting frustrations at working within the confines of an institution. After the tractor documentary, he decided to challenge himself and worked with a scriptwriter on a film about the famous and famously failed harvest of 10 million tons of sugarcane, a ridiculously ambitious goal Fidel Castro came up with in 1970, which plunged the country into a frenzy of volunteer labor. And it didn't work. It didn't achieve the, the 10 million ton goal. Harry wanted to film, uh, wanted wanted the film to let young volunteers at a, at a university tell the story in their terms, with music, dancing, kids being kids, as he said. 
He said, we wanted to lighten up this terrible, terrible defeat, which I knew was going to happen, referring to the harvest. I wanted to put Silvio's music in it, referring to popular Cuban singer Silvio Rodriguez. But Icaic was having none of it. The script was rejected, and Harry decided to make a career change. I thought the hell with it. I was already painting a lot, so I thought I'll be a painter. He handed in his resignation letter and received his official release from Icaic, which declared him, quote, free to dedicate himself to the visual arts. But it wasn't as easy as all that. Initially, there were rumors that he quit because he was going to Canada. This may explain why, despite his official relief, a release, he found himself in a legal battle when the Ministry of Labor informed him that he was, um, going, he was contravening the vagrancy laws because he didn't have a regular job. In retrospect, Harry says, I was an innocent little asshole. I didn't, really, I didn't realize that quitting an institution was a rare, unusual thing to do. He got himself a smart and very well-connected lawyer, and after several legal skirmishes, they left him alone. No less a revolutionary figure than American Black Panther leader, leader Huey Newton, in exile in Cuba at that time, um, re regarded Harry with some reverence as, quote, a sort of hero. This is from a, a, a passage in something, uh, something he wrote. Something, a, a sort of hero among the artists' union because of his insistence on fighting for his right to work independently. Newton also um, owned some of Harry's artwork. Thus begins the next chapter of Harry's life. In 1970, he married Sylvia Gutierrez, and young Harsel was born. Through the 1970s, Harry eked out a living as an artist. He assured his parents not to worry about him and his young family because the Cuban state provided free healthcare, education, and subsidized housing. True enough, but I'm skeptical of his declaration because one of the most remarkable aspects of his correspondence with his parents are the 20 years of shopping lists he sent to Canada. His lists are humorously, but also sadly, familiar to anyone with family ties or friendships in Cuba today. Um, these are exactly the same things that we bring today. Toothpaste, soap, razor blades, books and magazines, replacement parts for US-made appliances or cars. Harry, Harry definitely had to hustle. He taught private art classes and occasionally sold his paintings. He branched out into making small enamels, hoping that these would be a cheaper and more saleable alternative. The Cuban government demonized market relations in various ways at different points in history. But in the early 1970s, artists and artisans were permitted to sell their work. Harry participated in craft shows in uh, Plaza de la Catedral in Old Havana, um, every Saturday morning. He also worked with Cuba's premier stained glass artist, Rosa Maria de la Terga, who also worked with Vera Donifer, who's in the audience today. Together, Harry and Rosa Maria painstakingly repaired the glass domed ceiling of the Capitolio, the Capitol building. And he also helped her with these magnificent murals she made of Cuban artist René Portocarrero's paintings in a restaurant in the outskirts of Havana. Some of you will recognize the friends who happily accompanied me to the restaurant was I, when I was doing my Finding Harry Tanner in Havana uh, field work. His paintings, I think, were his pride and joy a vocation he continued until he began, became too ill to hold a paintbrush. In the 70s, he exhibited in Havana alongside many other painters of his generation. He holds a place in the Cuban art history canon in books and in the memories of, Cuban, of the Cuban art curators that I've interviewed. His work is, I believe, only held in one Cuban state institution, a museum, as the example of the two paintings I first saw in Adrian Hunter's front hallway suggests, he often painted stories or characters drawn from Cuban history. So I'm gonna just show you a few examples. Um, 
This one you've already seen, it was the, uh, the painting that illustrated today's lecture. I'd actually found out from, uh, from Harsel last night that this was actually painted from a photograph done by uh, a well-known Cuban photographer. But we've, nobody, has, nobody has seen the photograph, at least easily seen it um, yet. Dancing is a way of life in Cuba. Melissa Noventa. This one I've seen in person um, in Becky and Harry's house. It is, it's spectacular. In, it's spectacular, but in person it's really spectacular. I'm going to, later on, I'm going to tell you how to see, see more of these. I'll, I'm going to give you a link. So some of these were painted in Cuba. Some were painted when he returned to Canada in 1984. Um, I'm not going to elaborate much on this chapter of his life, except to note that a visa dispute with Cuban authorities kept him in Canada, unable to return to Cuba for some years. In Toronto, he had a studio just around the corner from Honest Ed's, and he continued to sell and exhibit his work. In May 1988, he married Becky Taylor, with whom he lived the rest of his days. Havana in the 1960s was a magnet for the world, for Canadians no less than anybody else. Leonard Cohen came to visit in 1961 and got stuck by the Bay of Pigs invasion. His mother had to get the Canadian embassy to help him leave the country. He came home and wrote a hilarious poem about it, The Last Tourist in Havana. I highly recommend it. Conrad Black visited for a couple of days in 1969. He was so depressed by what he called Fidel's tropical Stalinism that he left immediately to visit a business acquaintance in Palm Beach where, and I quote, he, he took comfort among the mansions and the Roy Rolls Royces. Harry himself played a significant role as host, translator, and unofficial or popular Canadian ambassador for many years. His correspondence mentions visits from um, people like activist and writer Dimitri Rosopoulos from Montreal, filmmaker Norman McLaren also from Montreal. He became friends with many of the Canadian teachers and researchers who were part of the CUSO Engineering Education Project, people like agronomist Dean Jean Donifer, who sadly passed <laughs> recently in here in Kingston, his artist wife Vera, and their three kids, one of whom, Laura, is here today and also was Beck uh, was uh, Harsel's babysitter from that from that era. This is actually a CUSO reunion um, that uh, that was held. Um, at some point um, here in Kingston before I, I started working on this, on this project. <laughs> I've actually, yes, I've interviewed all the, all the people in this, in this photo. I think I've, ever, I've, I've interviewed everyone I've found about the CUSO project, which isn't this story, but it, it's, it, it, it is an amazing. Amazing story. So, to conclude, I've interviewed for this project, um, you know, this, this in general ongoing project, about 150 people, Cubans and Canadians so far. Harry is different from every single one of them. Neither visitor nor native, his life teaches me about people whose very existence confounds the term nation. I'm going to show you a few minutes of or one of his very short uh, films, um, as I mentioned. But before I do, I want to leave you with this quote from Ivan de la Nuez, a Cuban cultural commentator. He writes, if I were a political scientist, I would have nothing to do but die of boredom by studying the Cuban state, which hasn't changed its model in half a century. But as a cultural critic, I can scan the society, which is so much richer and always more Cuban. Now that could be considered a superficial understanding of what political scientists do. 
or perhaps even of the Cuban state, for that matter. But I think it gets at something important for those who want to understand human relations across borders, perhaps especially so between first and third worlds. That's why the experiences of people seemingly on the periphery of international power relations matters. Harry was unique in that he didn't really cross national borders. He almost lived on top of them, or maybe despite them, until they, they, they trapped him in Canada for a while. But Harry, like so many people in Cuba and Canada who have spent time in each other's company, trying to understand each other and themselves, are exactly the register from which foreign policy begins. When I interviewed Harry's daughter, Harsel, in 2018 in Havana, she spoke about Harry's complicated relationship with and departure from the Film Institute. They lived a block away from the Institute. She grew up with many of his friends in the film world. She told me sometimes they play old documentaries on TV, and when they introduce them, I wait to hear his name. I never do. I know he was there, even if he was, you know, off camera, off in the corner. This is why I'm so grateful to Harry's family for donating the papers of this unique voice and to the Queen's archives for recognizing their importance. So now, let me introduce you to Pepe Trinchero. <laughs> I worked with a colleague in Havana, um, who I was in touch with today to tell her that I was, that I was doing this, uh, to translate um, a lot of the, uh, the documentaries that, that, that Harry uh, was involved in. That which, that which exists, at least, or at least, that which exists easily um, on, uh, on VHS. Now I've put them into digital format. And with the help of Dairon Morajon Perez and Melissa Noventa, two grad students here at Queens who work on Cuba issues, um, they, uh, they subtitled them all. They put them into uh, subtitles. So, Pepe is... Six, I think six minutes long.
I would be very happy to hear, hear, hear reactions, try to answer questions, but especially hear reactions. I'm at this point in this project, I have been working on it for a long time. I have something coming out um, in the Canadian Historical Review on the CUSO project, actually, on the, um, the development aid project and that, uh, those, uh, those kinds of exchanges. I'm working a lot on the music chapter and there will be another chapter of, you know, what I think of in my head as some of my favorite people and <laughs> that I've met in this work, some of my favorite, uh, most, uh, most interesting personalities um, that I've encountered in this Canada-Cuba exchange. And I, I think that's where, um, uh, where, where Harry will fit, um, but I think he could, you know, he could go all kinds of other places as well. Um, and so that's all by way of saying that I need help thinking about things. This is not like a project where it's already at the printer. This is, uh, this is all, um, all in process. So any ideas or, or reactions would be welcome. Um, I think um, my job it, right now is to say uh, thank you to Karen and I'll say it again after but uh, really thank you for that like hugely illuminating uh, and lively talk um, and thank you for um, uh, really thank you uh, for taking Harry seriously and I join Karen in acknowledging and uh, Harsel and Becky uh, and um, uh, and thanking uh, Heather, Mark, and Ken and the other folks at the archives for bringing Harry here. My purpose is to field questions, um, but, the, but I want to say one thing first. I met Harry um, and Becky on uh, August 12th, 2017, thanks to Karen. Um, I remember thinking how I, uh, thinking, I, I remember thinking I should be more surprised uh, by what we who study Cuban film did not know about him. How foundational he was to the setting up of the technical side of the animation studio, how close he was to Alea, how active he was as a filmmaker and cinematographer. Institutions can forget people, especially when they leave. But people remember people. And uh, when I went to the Cuban Film Archives last December as part of a trip about another filmmaker who was neglected for decades, I met Francisco Cordero, the chief archivist of the Film Institute, film archivist. Um, and I asked him about Harry, and he stopped mid-gate and cried. And he said, he was my friend. And so friendships got us here. And I'm really grateful for that. And I'm grateful that Harry's memory has a place for us to visit too. So I'm going to field questions to Karen. That's my role. And there are two microphones. Uh, so as, uh, um, as Ken asked, could you please make sure that you speak into it so that it can be recorded? I'll stand here, Karen, and then you can stand to the microphone. I might start with this one. Is this off? Give it a second. Now? Ooh, there I am. Um, well, and it's actually maybe even just what you were mentioning at the end and, and showing that I don't know an awful lot about the history, but that cartoon seemed like super interesting. <laughs> also just in its technique, mm -hmm. right? Like a, what that seemed kind of fairly ooh, progressive in it's like the, the cartoon on the photograph and the, like that kind of, um, I guess my question, like was it? <laughs> um, are they, was that a certain style that was mm. being used at the time or was that something that was sort of showing that playfulness that mm -hmm. you're talking about mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. uh, Harry? Um, I don't know enough about the genre of animation to really have a, much of an answer for that. What I do know is that um, just as Cuba, you know, was and is famous for all kinds of cultural things, music, dance, films is right up there. That's a that's a kind of that's a kind of a knowledge that I think has 
has not been lost, but it's less, it's perhaps less well known how important the Cuban film world was, particularly in back in the day when there were perhaps more resources to put into things like that. And within the film world, the, anim the Ikaik anim animation studio was also really, really important out there. So my, you know, halfway educated guess would be that they were they were you know ahead of the ahead of the curve and at the top of their game um, in terms of animation in that era because that's what because there was all this incredible creative energy and some amount of political will to to keep that moving. The film professor might have a a better a better answer to that. Hello. Uh, thank you, Karen, for the beautiful presentation. I think it's, it's a really nice uh, work. Um, I was thinking because uh, today I watched like a documentary about Carlos Marighella, um, the Brazilian guerrilla warfare who created this manual, who was like in entire Latin America. Um, and I saw this work. And, and I think it's really interesting because like a couple of months ago, I read a book really interesting, like um, the Historia Minima of the uh, Cold War from Bani Petina, uh, and and he said like how we can change this perspective that the study of Cold War has related with like the superpower vision of this, mm -hmm. and ca and how we can change this perspective from Latin America. So create a kind of new uh, um, uh, Cold War history. Mm -hmm. So my question is uh, probably a comment. I don't know. <laughs> uh, is how this like work? How this kind of uh, like uh, documentaries uh, you can see like around Latin America can fix in this idea of this kind of new history of, mm. of the Cold War mm. Mm. in Latin America, and this kind of new relationship, for example, uh, Canada as a, as a part of this, this, this narrative also. Because I think it's most of the time, like we talk about United States and relationship with the United States and Russia, but also we have like other, other countries or um, the uh, solidarity between like South-South solidarity. So, I think how this kind of work can change this kind of perspective. Yeah, yeah. That's my question. Yeah. Well, I think I have a, a little bit of an answer, um, and most of it is going to be, Jose, to, to turn it back on you. I, I am, I'm a Canadian historian. I, um, I study Cuban-Canadian relations. You know, we all, we're all located in something, right? Even, even if we're doing, quote unquote, transnational research, we start, we light down, we start from somewhere. I start from Canada, I start from Canadian history, um, I start from an understanding of the Cold War that is extremely binary US, um, US Soviet Union. I have found in my travels and study and, and teaching and reading in Cuba that that um, American versus Russian binary understanding of the Cold War continues to, you know, makes a lot of sense. Of course it makes a lot of sense. Look at the, um, I'm, I don't have to go into the look at that, right? There's, a, there's decades of history of that binary playing itself out on, on Cuban soil and in, Cuban, in Cubans' lives. I think it's, it's people like you um, who have an interest in breaking out of that binary understanding and thinking about the relationship between Cuba globally, just the way we, you know, people are starting to think about Can Canadian relations as with people other than the US or the, or the UK. Um, and I think that could actually go a long ways towards changing our, our, changing our understandings of how Cubans lived that US-Russian 
binary because they were living all kinds of other global relations. The one that gets the play, right, is the, is the Soviet um, American thing that made the headlines, that got all the attention, but that was by no means uh, the, only, the only story. So you're working on a project on um, Chilean-Cuban relations in this era. The more people who do those kinds of studies, I think the, the richer we're gonna be in terms of um, understanding the Cold War as something that affected everybody. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Susan. Uh, this is most like more like a request uh, because I I have so many students here and they are learning about the history of Latin America. And uh, uh, when we study the Cold War, the the normal discussion is around the United States and Latin America and and all that. So I don't know if you can talk since you're an expert, really. And we have, I think, all of us here have learned so much about the relationship between Canada and Latin America, that when often when we are in Latin America, mm. our knowledge stops in the United States, and we don't go over there. So I don't know if you can give a little bit of uh, context of the relationship between Canada and Cuba in the 60s mm. and 70s, mm. and how do you locate Harry Tanner within yeah, that yeah. historical context? Yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of the, in some ways that's the, the story of my life um, in terms of what I'm trying to figure out, right? Um, and it depends, you know, the simple answer is, I suppose it depends on where you look. One could write or have an understanding of Canadian-Cuban relations through the lens of the state, of both governments, and that would focus on issues like the fact that Canada and Mexico um, alone did not cut off relations with Cuba, did not blockade the country, did they maintain diplomatic relations on the entire, this side of, this side of the world. Um, and those state-to-state -state relationships would also um, talk about trade relations and the way in which Canada was able to a certain extent to take advantage of the absence, the strange absence of the US in Cuba in its, um, in its, certainly in its economic relations. A state-to-state -state relationship would also note, however, um, that, and here we would get into, you know, relationships between prime ministers that Canada um, always walked, a kind of a, I'll call it a tightrope, um, between an independent foreign policy with respect to, to Cuba and not pissing off the U.S. too much. But also, and let it be, you know, I don't want to leave the impression that Canada was the honest broker. Canada also spied on Cuba and uh, Cuba and Cubans and, and parlayed that information to the U.S. So it's a complicated relationship just at the state-to-state -state level. Um, then you throw in people and culture and filmmakers and, and artists, and that's why I'm gonna be working on this book for, for the rest of my life, I think. There's a way in which, I will just say this, there's a way in which, oh, oh excuse me, tourism. How could we not acknowledge the fact that 1.5, pre-COVID, 1.3, 1.5 million Canadians visit Cuba, um, visited Cuba annually. Um, there is a way in which um, I think Cuba acts as a kind of a Cuban, let's say at the state level at least, Cuban-Canadian more, I don't even want to say friendships, I'll say more, fr less hostility, right? Way less hostility um, than the US, generally speaking. That can also ask, uh, act, I think, to um, ignore, perhaps repress a little bit um, of Canada's um, other kinds of relationships in Latin America, which are um, rely on resource extraction, which are tremendously exploitative economically and politically, um, and as as we watch what's going on in Haiti, that becomes even more obvious that Canada is not the good international honest broker. That that sometimes, um, if you were just looking at Canada's narrative of itself in Cuba, you would think, oh, we're the, we're the good ones. We're the ones that do. I mean, sure, we're different politically, but we respect their sovereignty and we respect their right to exist. And that has been. That has been, it's not like that's a lie, that has been true at different times, but there's a way in which I think um, Cuba acts as, um, Cuba acts as a kind of a, a strange kind of, I don't know, bomb on the Canadian conscience um, 
for, um, that, we, uh, that, that, that lets us overlook a whole lot of other things. That's, that's at, at the state level. At the, at the popular level, I think there's a lot, I'm not really doing this, there's, some, there's one uh, Canadian political scientist who um, is working on this project, and I hope there will be others. What does it mean to these two countries that 1.5 million Canadians visit annually, um, even if it's quote unquote beach tourism? And because I think um, what, I, what I know anecdotally is that um, people form relationships within those resorts and friendships within those resorts, which I actually think are perhaps different than other, uh, than happens in other parts of the world. So that's a whole other, what does mass tourism do to people to people relationships, even though it's almost totally one-sided. That's just a whole messy bunch of ideas there. <laughs> I'm going to just sit. Oh, God. OK. Um, I'm going to um, shamelessly funnel my dissertation into this, because I see that that's what we're doing. Um, and now that Claudio has students here, which I think it's super important, um, sticking to the theme, theme of uh, Cold War and mm -hmm. Canada and Latin American relations, my dissertation. Um, I think it's important when the historical uh, profession is being questioned, especially now, um, I think it would be super important to hear from someone like you, why do these type of archives make a difference? Um, we tend to believe that reality is constructed someplace else but it's really not. It comes from people like Mr. Tanner. It comes from his commitment to uh, telling a story of making those bonds and those uh, relations so much more than everyday life. I mean, we, we certainly profit from them, but uh, what would you say as, as the expert, like Claudia said, um, and why would people want to keep doing this? Why are archives so important for the way in which we think our world, if that makes sense? Yeah. Thank you. That's a huge question. You answered, I think you answered some of your own question within your, uh, 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 the way you were putting it. Um, I think what's wonderful to me about just here's this with a tiny little example, tiny little drop in the bucket of um, someone like Harry Tanner's papers being, you know, well looked after, professionally looked after, professionally housed and, and available for, uh, for whoever, whenever, for whenever, whatever period of time. That, it's not exactly a counter archives, but like maybe in some ways it is. People, there are community archives of the women's movement, of lesbian and gay people, of black archives, right? There are indigenous archives. There's all kinds of uh, community approaches to archives. And I think um, archives like a university archives or a state archives for that matter, also share the same um, responsibility, interest in having a, uh, having a range of voices. Um, why do we think that history is made by people who got their names in the Globe and Mail all the time, right? Why are those stories the only stories that, that we think are, are um, relevant? And what's the play between, because obviously I'm not saying that, you know, uh, that we make our own <laughs> reality, that state structures um, immigration policies, for example, visa barriers, all of that mat mat mattered to Harry himself in his life, let alone all, all of the rest of us. So, of course, uh, the interplay between state power and popular, um, popular activities um, in whatever world, cultural or, or whatever, are important, but states, states can try to write the script, but they don't always get very far. 
States can control the borders, states can make the laws, states can, of course, control the, uh, the legitimate use of force, but states don't tell us what, you know, what music to listen to, what music to write, what films to make. Um, and so that's why I think we need uh, a much more bottom-up understanding. Uh, thank you for a very illuminating lecture. I don't know much about Cuba, and I'm delighted to meet Harry and feel proud of him as a Canadian. Um, listening to what you described as his creativity in film and then in arts in the first decades of the Cuban Revolution, I wondered if there's a parallel with the early decades of the Soviet Union and that revolution. Mm -hmm. We know in the first decade of the Soviet Revolution, they freed the arts. Uh, we have artists like Popova, Malevich, uh, Kandinsky. Uh, we have filmmakers like Eisenstein. We have uh, writers like Volgakov and people. But then at the end of the decade, there seemed to be a, a change. They realized that the arts could be a dangerous thing. They could undermine a regime. And everything is either suppressed or goes underground. And I'm wondering whether Harry's decision to leave the Institute reflects that in Cuba. Uh, do the arts suddenly become a threat rather than a potential? Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I know what, what he told me when we, when we spoke of. I know what I read in his papers. Um, I think the arts are always a threat everywhere. And I think um, a lot of states um, of whatever political orientation um, always do that kind of dance between, um, you know, sort of unleashing and promoting and creating, but also selecting very selectively what to what to promote and what to what to create. Um, it's way. I mean, the arts. I'll talk about Cuba today. The arts are under continued. When you say were the were the arts threatening in the 1970s, the arts continue to be. And of course, things wax and wane. But um, some of the most vociferous um, criticism of the current Cuban government is coming both from inside and the outside, inside and outside the country, from artists. Um, some of the first protests. Uh, public protests in the past few years in Cuba took place by, uh, were initiated by artists, meeting, for example, outside the Ministry of Culture, which made, you know, just, you know, to demand, to make certain demands, reasonable, in my view, demands, um, that doesn't sound like much. In Cuba, that's a lot. The, you know, it was, a, it was an un, unsanctioned protest. So um, I think... There's a way, one of my, one of my favorite um, Cuban historians is a woman named Lillian Guerra, uh, historians of the Cuban Revolution. Lillian Guerra um, puts it like this, the revolution unleashes all of this emancipatory p uh, potential among poor people, among peasants, among black people, among women. Um, people who had been um, completely outside the centers of power for uh, in Cuba as as everywhere else basically for for decades and decades and decades the Cuban um, revolution unleashes that uh, those demands people start thinking of themselves as citizens people start thinking of themselves as people with uh, who can make demands people with rights um, and the Cuban government um, tends to try to unleash, but then also kind of get ahead of that and channel that into, into um, places that are not so, I don't want to say not threatening, but um, I, I guess the key part here is get, gets ahead of it, right? So it's not, it's a way of unleashing, um, I think, a, a kind of a liberatory potential of disenfranchised people, but always, always steered always steered in a particular direction. So, and, and I think the arts are, are, um, are an excellent example of that. Um, I have a question, no dissertation here. Um, so, Karen, I'm wondering that all the times that you spoke with Harry and you visited him in the studio in Toronto, right? Did he ever talk to you or show you his very unique way of painting? Like, he, his paintings are incredibly luminous because of the way he made his own paint. Yeah. 
and I know you're all students here, but uh, you know, of political. I lived in Cuba in the 70s, so I went to art school there. If you have any questions about that, it was quite fascinating. Um, did he talk about his method? Are you who I think you are? Are you uh, Harry's? No. It, no. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> so I knew there was somebody was else coming that. Uh, <laughs> Becky, why don't you talk about it? No, I think we have Marvin here. Who's oh, that's who I thought. Yeah, that's who I mean. Where is she? Um, so I, I'm, I took classes with Harry, uh, art classes, and he taught me about egg tempera, which is painting with the yolk of the egg and pigment and creating a type of luminous uh, surface because the, um, it's, it's, uh, it's very bright, not as bright as oil but not as faded as watercolor. And it gives this really special luminous uh, surface. He was very precise in his work. It was important to him that the, the piece would tell a story. Otherwise, uh, it's just a, a, a decoration. Um, uh, he, his stories uh, were about what he lived, uh, his environment, and um, he um, he was very a very good listener. So he was able to also tell the stories of other people, and he said that made him very successful with women. <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm interested actually to know if uh, the university would acquire some of his art. And um, I'm also, uh, yeah, who, who wants to answer? <laughs> we, would, we would love for that to happen. Okay. <laughs> and um, I, was, uh, I, I was wondering also, because you're a historian, I was wondering also if, um, if all the Canadian, American, and British what he called the ABC community, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who came to uh, Cuba, did they come once the companies were there or did they come just to have an adventure before that? Uh, because I, I remember him telling me about his grandfather, I don't know on which side of the family, Harsel will tell us, who was a dentist and uh, he basically had an office on a boat and had one dentist mm -hmm. chair and he would pull teeth. That was his job. And he would go around the island and by the time he finished, he would start again with other sailors who had. So did people go only because there was a company mm -hmm. that hired them or did, did people go just for the adventure. Do you, you mean in the pre-revolution yes. era? Yes. Really interesting question. There's so m students, if anybody's looking for a, a research project, the, his the history of Cuban-Canadian relations, even in the post-59 period, is scant. We could literally count on, on uh, probably two hands the people that have done, um, the, the scholars who have done research on Canadian-Cuban relations, whether state, to state or people to people or music or, you know, it's, it's not much, there's not much uh, work that's been done. Um, Pre-revolution, even less. So the short answer is, the short answer is, I think there's, there seems to be, um, there's sort of, you know, characters who turn up, who end up in Cuba for one strange reason or another, not like, not a sort of logical path. The logical path are, you know, the bankers and the people who work for other uh, Canadian companies, um, which were, which were um, not extensive, but certainly existed at that time, and, and of course continue to in a certain way. Um, and so I think we don't, we probably don't know enough to, I don't know enough um, to, about Canadian-Cuban relations pre-1959 to know why people were, why, why other people were there, other Canadians were there. There weren't, and also, it doesn't seem like there were many of them. 
they also like every you know like everywhere they get. I have been talking to people about uh, people post excuse me post fifty nine um, about this. Um, was there, for example, um, a group of Canadians who were there for whatever reasons, political solidarity, uh, living, marriage, whatever? Um, and most people have. When I've asked people, people like Adrian Hunter who who were there for a very long time, they said, no, we just got, we got subsumed under the Americans, right? There were American associations of political people or other kinds of people, but either there weren't enough Canadians or nobody paid any attention or I don't know what. Yeah, thanks, Karen, for a uh, very impressive talk. Um, can you can you speak a little bit about uh, how Harry identified himself um, in terms of home and belonging? Um, because you, you I mean you use the term uh, uh, Cuban Canadian in your in your title, and as a historian uh, interested in, in migration research, this is uh, I'm quite quite used to it. This is how we. I, I don't know, tend to box people, you know, uh, somebody moves from place A to place B and then we combine this, but uh, this is not ne necessarily connected to uh, how people really identify themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, to make this f maybe a little bit more specific, I mean, you talk to him in his late years, maybe um, did he reflect on wh who he was? Uh, and um, there's a, a second question connected to this um, about his artwork. Uh, and because you showed this picture um, uh, showing him um, in Toronto in front of this painting he was working on. And as far as I have seen, the motif was still Latin American or, or Cuban. Uh, is there a shift when he mm -hmm. came back to mm -hmm. Canada? Mm -hmm. Did he also paint it? The beautiful, beautiful Frontenac lakes, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, it, what what does this mean? Um, I'm going to answer the first question, then I'm going to see if Gary wants to take the second question. The first, uh, I have a simple and typically hairy, funny response to the like the identity. Who am I? Um, the only other time I've, I've spoken about Harry in um, in a in an academic setting was a conference on the on the 19. I can't remember the parameters. Something about the history of the 1960s that took place in, at Humber College um, a few years ago. I was just starting this research, but I I made a stab at talking about uh, talking about Harry. I told him uh, that I was going off to this conference. I was going to talk about him, and he said. That's great. Maybe you all can figure out whether I'm Cuban or Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an I don't really have an answer for that other than that, but maybe that is the answer. Um, I didn't I should have pointed out in one of the slides that there's a website with Harry's paintings, um, harrytannerartist.com. Um, and on the website, there's a book that um, Gary Gary, right? Greenwood. Um, put together some years ago um, about Harry's, uh, a, a wider vision of Harry's art, which includes his, the stuff that he did in and about Canada. And I wonder if you have an answer to that question about his, his stylistic changes. Okay, what I, what I would say about Harry's artwork is that he was a Canadian who painted like a Cuban uh, because he brought the same concerns for humanity that he had expressed in Cuba, and he brought it to Canada. So uh, one painting I'm thinking of is set in the Eaton Center, mm -hmm. where he focuses very clearly on the fact that a lot of the people doing servile work were uh, the disenfranchised people, black, black, whatever you wish. And yet the, the whole attitude that he took to it could have just been parachuted out of his other paintings that he had done in Cuba. So it was, for me, it was, uh, it, in Canada, he just translated. I, I think there, there's one little comment I would like to make, though, is, is uh, I, I, I do believe Harry missed Cuba a great deal. Because in Cuba, that was a rich, uh, a, he had a rich gift in a rich country. And when that country said, we don't need you as much as we thought we needed you. Translating it to Canada, he, he was a foreigner in his own place. So it's a, a, it, I, I share your, I don't want to call it confusion, but you know the fact that Harry is so human, 
that he's, he's going to be hard to place into an archive precisely, which is exactly why he should be there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There is a. There, we're going to have a reception momentarily, but um, if you could uh, join me in thanking Karen for that beautiful and lively. Thank you. Thank you all.